electron configurations of ions. So anions form when atoms gain electrons. So if you're looking at writing an electron configuration for an anion, a negative ion, you have to add electrons to the electron configuration. For cations, you have to subtract electrons. And those electrons are subtracted from the valence shell. So for the main group elements, for the cations, you re remove electrons in the same order, I mean, in the reverse of the order that they filled. So aluminum fills 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p1. Removing electrons, you're going to take out this uh, 3p electron first, and then the 3s, one of these, and then the other. So let's, let's draw that out. So this is a complete um, orbital diagram for aluminum. To make an aluminum 3 plus ion, we're going to remove valence electrons. And we're going to do those in reverse order. So this was the last one we put in. So that's the first one we get rid of. So we get rid of this one. And then next we get rid of this guy in here. And then we get rid of this one. So this now is the 3 plus ion, and you write down what it is, and it's 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. Any questions? Transition metals have to be a little more difficult. Um, here, we're removing the valence electrons. This does not always correspond to the reverse filling order. So for the iron atom, it fills in the order that we write them here. So the 4s orbital fills before the 3d orbital. But when this becomes an ion, the, the electrons that are lost first are the valence electrons. These are the valence electrons in the 4s. Oops. So these are the valence electrons. Those get lost first. So for making the Fe2 plus cation, we're going to remove the 4s electrons. So the electron configuration is this. We're not going to write 4s0. If there aren't any electrons in that level, you just don't write that level. If it loses one more electron, now that will come out of the last orbital here. So that'll come out of the D. So we'll end up with 3D5. And this would be the, the orbital diagram for iron 3. This, is, this one's empty, and there's, the 3D is half full. Any questions? It's always the valence electrons that are lost first. Um, Paramagnet, paramagnetic and diamagnetic. Um, paramagnetic atom or ion has some unpaired electrons. And this causes that atom or ion to interact with a magnetic field. That unpaired electron generates a small magnetic field due to its spin. It's not coupled with um, an electron of the opposite spin. And so these uh, atoms or ions are attracted to magnetic fields. A diamagnetic atom or ion um, has all of the electrons being paired up. And so this is not attracted to a magnetic field. In fact, it's slightly repelled. A paramagnetic 
um, species interact with the magnetic field and diamagnetic do not. Write the electron configuration in orbital, yeah, orbital diagram for each ion. Predict whether each will be paramagnetic or diamagnetic. Okay, so cobalt 2 plus. So cobalt is in period 4. Um, we only need to look at the, the electrons that are past the noble gas. So we've got, it's really hard to look at sideways. We've got argon. So electron configuration will be argon, 4s2, 3d7, sorry. It's got nine valence electrons. And if we draw the um, orbital diagram for that, we've got the 4s, and we've got 3d. I'm doing the atom first. So we've got two in here. And we've got seven in here. So there's five, six, seven. That's the atom. So the ion, we have to remove two electrons. Which electrons are we going to remove? The 4s or the 3d? 4s, because these are the valence electrons. So we're going to get rid of those guys. So then for the ion, the the electron configuration is AR3D7, because we removed the two valence electrons. The orbital diagram, we're going to get rid of those 4S electrons. Let's erase those. And that's what it looks like. It's not obvious from the electron configuration whether all of the electrons are paired or not. When we look at the orbital diagram, though, are there unpaired electrons? Yeah, there are unpaired electrons. So this one is paramagnetic. This is another one where we've got paired and unpaired, paramagnetic, diamagnetic, my brain always wants to say that paramagnetic is where they're all paired up. But that's spelled differently, right? This is P-A-R, and pairing is P-A-I-R. Diamagnetic, di means two. All the elements, I mean, all the atom electrons, all the electrons are coming in by twos. Diamagnetic, all paired up in twos. So diamagnetic, not attracted to the magnetic field. Paramagnetic is because of these unpaired electrons. So let's look at N3 minus. First, we'll do the um, configuration and diagram for just plain old nitrogen. So we've got helium, that's not helium. And then we've got 2S2. 2p3. And if we look at the orbital diagram, we have 2s and we have 2p. And we'll stick the electrons in there. There's two in here and there's three in there. This is a negative ion and so we have to add electrons. So the charge is three minus, we have to add three electrons. So the orbital diagram, I'm just going to keep going and put in three more electrons. So one, two, three. That means that we're adding the electrons into that 2p, and so we end up with He, 2s2, 2p6. When nitrogen becomes an ion, it fills up all its boxes. Are there any unpaired electrons in the nitride ion? No. They're all in twos. So it's diamagnetic. 
Any questions? Making an atom into an ion has a big effect on its size. So trends in ionic radius. So here we have um, an illustration where we have in the gray a representation of the atom and in the red a representation of the cation. And we'll notice that a lithium cation is much smaller than a lithium atom. Lithium atom has a radius of 152 picometers, and the lithium ion is only 60 picometers. That's a lot less than half as big, right? Huge change by losing one electron. What the heck? Well, what are we doing? We're losing the valence electrons. We're losing that outermost level. And so now we've got just the core electrons. And, and I like to think of... I think the Bohr model is just very helpful in understanding the general structure of the atom. And so you can think of it as being like an onion, and each of these principal levels is another layer of the onion skin, right? You peel off that partial broken up level on the outside, and you've got this nice smooth level, but now the onion's smaller, right? Every time you peel off a layer, the onion gets smaller. So here we've peeled off a layer, and the atom is smaller. Not only that, but you have a higher effective nuclear charge. And so that pulls it in even more. So let's, let's just draw a diagram for, for lithium here. Lithium has three protons in its nucleus. And it's got two electrons in, in that uh, 1s level. And out here in the 2s level, it has one electron. So this valence electron is experiencing an effective nuclear charge of plus one, right? Because it's got two electrons shielding it. If we get rid of that electron to make the ion, now we're looking at the effective nuclear charge on the outermost electrons, which are these guys, which were closer to start with, and now they're experiencing a plus three charge. So they are pulled in even farther, and so when you make an atom into a cation, it gets a lot smaller. Anions get bigger. It's a little bit harder to understand why anions get so much bigger, but that's okay. We don't need to understand that. We just need to remember that anions are bigger. And, and that makes sense because you take something off of an atom, you would expect it to get smaller. You put something on, you expect it to get larger, right? If you look at your waist size and then you put on um, a bulky sweater and measure your waist size, it's going to be larger, right? Because the sweater takes up space. So adding on electrons, um, we've got no change in the nucleus, no change in the number of protons, and so the nuclear charge does become lower. We looked at a very simplistic way of calculating it, and that wouldn't show it, but it does become lower. So we see that um, So when you go from oxygen to oxide, um, it, it almost doubles in size. So it's a big change. Any questions? The prefix iso means the same. So isoelectronic means the same electrons. So these are ions. They're different elements, but they have the same number of electrons. So sulfide, chloride, potassium ion, and calcium ion all have 18 electrons. The sulfur has gained two extra electrons. Sulfur atom only has 16 electrons, but you add two, you get 18. Chlorine has 17, because it has 17 protons, but it's got a negative one charge, it's got 18 electrons, potassium and calcium. So same number of electrons, but these are not the same size. These ions are not the same size. We learned that when an atom becomes a cation, it gets smaller. When it becomes an anion, it gets larger. 
And so when we look at these with all the same number of electrons, the anions are going to be larger than the cations. Calcium is going to be the smallest. It has the most protons, same number of electrons. It's got a higher effective charge, and so it pulls those electrons in closer. Potassium is the next largest. It has 19 protons. Uh, sulfide is the smallest. It's got the fewest number of protons, and so those electrons are held more loosely. So isoelectronic species, the the anions are going to be larger and the cations are going to be smaller. So choose the larger atom or ion from each pair. So potassium atom or potassium ion, which is bigger? The atom, right? Because when you take an electron off to make a positive ion, it gets smaller. Fluorine or fluoride, which is larger? Fluoride. We're adding electrons. That makes it bigger. Calcium or chloride? Well, how many protons does calcium have? Twenty. How many protons does chlorine have? Seventeen. Um, calcium, the atom, would have seven, I'm sorry, 20 electrons, right? But it's an ion, so how many electrons does it have? 18. And chlorine, the atom, has 17 protons, 17 neutrons, 17 electrons, but the ion would have 18 electrons. Right? So the two plus and the minus. They have the same number of electrons. These are isoelectronic. So which one's larger? The anion. The anion is larger because it has a lower charge in the nucleus. The force of attraction between the nucleus and the electrons depends on the magnitude of the charges. A plus 17 versus a plus 20. Plus 20 is more attractive. You get shielding in there, too, but the trend is the same. So chloride is larger because the force of attraction between the electrons and the nucleus is less. Or just like with these guys where we're looking at an atom and its ion, the anion's larger, the cation's smaller. These are isoelectronic. The anion's larger, the cation's smaller. Ionization energy. Ionization energy is the amount of energy needed to remove an electron from an atom or an ion in the gaseous state. And we did some, some calculations using the Rydberg equation saying, well, how much energy would it take to remove an electron from, from this level, right? And so we had the 1 over n squared minus 1 over n squared, and one of the n's was infinity. We're not going to do any calculations like that, but we're going to look at the trend in ionization energies. Ionization energy is always positive because that's an endothermic process. You have to put energy into the atom to remove an electron. <coughs> Essentially, you have to pay the atom to give you its electron. You have to give it money so it'll give you the electron. So here's a generic metal, just M. So M in the gas state, and you add ionization energy, you can remove one electron. And the result is a plus one cation. You can take that plus one cation and put more energy in and pull a second electron off. So the ion plus more ionization energy gives you a two plus ion and another electron. This is the second ionization energy. The second ionization energy is always going to be more than the first ionization energy. I sometimes joke and say that, you know, it's a good thing the circus never came down my street when all my kids were younger because I probably would have sold some of them. 
So this is a little bit like selling children to the circus. So the first one, you're like, yeah, that one's a troublemaker today. You can have him cheap. But then they want to buy another kid. And now you're thinking, well, dad might notice when he comes home that there aren't as many children. I don't know. So the second one's going to cost more. And the more you, you go, the, the more expensive they become because they're, they're more precious now. That's a politically incorrect analogy. Um, so here's the trends. First ionization energy is going to decrease as we're going down a group. So if we look at helium, neon, argon, krypton, xenon, the noble gases, as we're going down, they are getting larger, and it's becoming easier to ionize them. So this also goes along with the uh, getting rid of children. I'm, I'm going to get away from the circus one. Going to the fair. No, the circus one works better, though, because it's paying. It's not just losing. OK, we'll stick with the circus. So you've got a mom like me with, with six children or another mom that only has one child. And the circus wants to buy a child. I've never really fleshed this one out before. This isn't so good. The circus wants to buy one of your children. I'm going to sell one a lot cheaper than my friend who only has the one child. Does that make sense? Because that child is closer, right? If we think of helium, helium is smaller. Its electron that it's going to potentially lose is closer to the nucleus. And so it's going to take more energy to pull it away. Xenon. The electron it's going to lose is on the outside. This is why the fair analogy works better. I'm going to go back to the fair. So go to the fair. You have six kids. You only have two hands, right? And so they're just like milling about, and you're yelling at them to stay close and stuff. I don't take my kids to the fair because I think it's a great place to lose children. And as much as I might talk about selling them to the circus, I really don't want to lose any of them. But the friend has one child, and she's got him by the hand. Who's more likely to lose a child? Me. Yeah, I can't hold on to all of them. I can't keep them all super close. It's just not possible. But the mom with one child can. Helium's got its electrons in close, very tight. It's harder to pull one off. So as you go down and atoms get larger, it becomes easier to ionize. So the ionization energy decreases. As we go across a period, what happens to the size of the atom? It gets smaller. Smaller atoms are harder to remove electrons from. So the general trend is as you go across a period, the ionization energy increases. Now there's some, some zigzags in here, but in general, as you're going across, it's going up. OK? Any questions? Trend in ionization energy is exactly opposite atomic radius. So if you, if you can think of, remember the atomic radius, and then think about me at the fair losing a child. So the larger atom, lower ionization energy. And here's a table showing trends. So as we go across, we see that the ionization energy is increasing in general. There are some exceptions. As we go down, the ionization energy decreases. <coughs> On the basis, periodic trends determine the element in each pair with the higher first ionization energy. So tin or iodine. So we're going to do the same sort of thing that we did before. We're going to look at where these are relative to each other in the periodic table. So if tin is over here, iodine is in the same period to the right. Which one has the higher first ionization energy? Which one is smaller? Tin? tin? No, iodine. Iodine's smaller because as we go across, it's counterintuitive, but the atoms get smaller. 
So iodine is going to have the lower ionization energy. I'm sorry. Higher ionization energy. I had some, uh, something else going on in my head. Smaller atom, higher ionization energy. These questions, when they show up on exams, often do not have good outcomes because your brain is thinking one thing and the question says something else. In my mind, I was thinking lower, but the question's asking for higher, so always double check. So, iodine. Um, calcium or strontium? So they're right on top of each other. We're looking for the highest ioniz higher ionization energy. So that's going to be the smaller atom. Who's smaller, calcium or strontium? Calcium. Carbon or phosphorus? There's carbon, there's phosphorus. So carbon, in terms of up and down, would have the higher. In terms of going across, phosphorus would. So we have conflicting trends. So I would guess that it would be carbon, but that's much less of a good guess than for the size. So I'd say not possible. Can't predict that. Fluorine or sulfur. Here again, these guys are kitty corner, but in the opposite way. Who's got the higher ionization energy? Fluorine. Look at the trend. Both, both of them going across says higher ionization energy. The trend going down also says higher ionization energy for fluorine. Any questions? Of course, there's got to be exceptions, right? And we saw some zigzags in here. Whoops, passed it. So we're going across, and there's some places where that trend is not working out, right? So what's up with that? So we see an exception between group 2A and group 3A, that boron has a smaller ionization energy than beryllium. Well, let's look at the electrons that they're losing. Um, so we'll draw up orbital diagrams for boron and beryllium, and we'll just do after helium. So boron. Boron has three valence electrons, and beryllium beryllium only has two valence electrons. So this is 2p and 2s. This is 2p. Oops. <laughs> 2s and 2p. So when boron is losing an electron, it's losing one from the 2p sublevel, which is higher in energy than the 2s sublevel. Right? A higher energy electron is easier to remove than a lower energy electron. So when, we, when we're removing one from beryllium, we're removing a 2s electron, which is lower in energy, so it's harder to remove. So boron has a lower ionization energy than beryllium, even though the trend predicts otherwise. But there are exceptions. Any questions? I'm not going to trick you on these exceptions. I just want you to know that they are there and why. Another exception that happens between groups 5A and 6A, let's look at nitrogen and oxygen. There's their uh, electron configurations and their orbital diagrams. 
So nitrogen has a half-filled 2p orbital. Oxygen has, we would also be removing a 2p electron, but this isn't half full exactly. This one has full and, and the others are, have one electron. So when we're removing an electron from oxygen, we're taking this one out. We're taking out that guy that's having to share a bed in the hotel. And what we're left with then is a half full level, which is a Groupon discount. So it's more stable. Here, this one already has the half filled 2p sublevel. And so it really would rather not mess that up. So it's going to be harder to remove an electron from nitrogen than from oxygen. That makes sense? Kind of. If we look at successive ionization energy, so same atom, just pulling off one electron, then another, and another, and another. Each time you pull an electron off, the ionization energy gets larger. The effect of nuclear charge is increasing. Um, so here for sodium, we pull off one electron, 496 um, kilojoules per mole to do that. The next one is a huge increase. For magnesium, the first one is 738, and the second one is about double that, 1450. And then the third one is a huge increase. This huge increase is where we're pulling off a core electron. Sodium has one valence electron. Pulling off the valence electron, not too bad. But now you're getting into its core, and it's much harder to remove electrons from the core. For magnesium, it has two valence electrons. The first two are going to come off relatively easily. The third one, 7,000 kilojoules. We might have predicted 2,800, but not 7,000. That's because now you're removing a core electron. Any questions? So here's a table. Here are the elements and their ionization energies. And in the red here is removing a core electron. Sodium has one valence electron. Pull that one off. You pull the core electron off, the price jumps up. Magnesium has two val valence electrons. You pull those off, not a big deal. Third one is a core electron. And so we see this consistently. Um, you get the first three off, and then there's this huge jump when you get the core electron being pulled off. Any questions? 